Hello. Welcome to Film Focus Recaps. In 1966, China is going through a cultural revolution launched by their leader Mao Zedong. The period of political violence is known as Red August and causes thousands of deaths as soldiers kill anyone who spreads modern teachings. In Beijing, a crowd demands punishment for teachers and students who are presented on a stage by soldiers. Most of the victims agree to be rehabilitated to avoid getting killed, however a physics professor refuses to give up his values and the soldiers bring out his wife, who has joined the revolution and begs her husband to change sides too. The professor refuses and the soldiers start beating him until he's dead while his daughter Wenji watches in tears. After the event is over, Wenji goes to retrieve the body, only to be surrounded by soldiers. In Inner Mongolia in 1967, soldiers are forcing the prisoners to cut down trees to build something secret. On top of the hill there's a base with a huge satellite dish, part of the secret project. There are weird stories about the area surrounding the dish, people lose their hair if they get too close and the clear weather turns stormy. Wenji is one of the working prisoners and befriends a soldier who gives her a book in English because he knows she can speak it. Unfortunately the commander eventually finds the book and sends her to division headquarters. Later in a freezing cell, Wenji is asked to sign a document so she can return to the construction corps. The document turns out to be a testimony against her father's associates so they can be traced down and killed. Wenji refuses and is punished with a bucket of cold water thrown on her and her bed. Afterward Wenji is taken to the base at the top of the hill. The soldiers there know about Wenji's scientific papers and since they need brains like that, she's given the option of rehabilitation there rather than in prison. Their research is of the highest security classification, so if she accepts she'll never be able to leave. Wenji doesn't hesitate to take the offer and is shown the secret experiment called the Red Coast Project. The technicians activate the satellite dish, causing a strange noise that makes all local birds panic crash against the dish, and fall dead. Afterward in a private meeting, Wenji deduces they aren't making weapons, and the soldiers confirm they're sending messages to outer space. In London in 2024, private investigator Clarence observes the murder scene of a physics doctor from MIT. There is a bunch of numbers scrawled up on the wall in blood, showing a countdown. There is also a message that says I still see it. The body is on the ground with his eyes missing and a knife in his hand, appearing to be a case of self-deletion. However Clarence has been seeing many cases lately of scientists that write a countdown on the wall before dying, so he's suspicious. At the Oxford University Particle Accelerator, Saul informs his co-worker Vera that the project they're working on is about to be shut down because their test results don't follow the rules of physics. After telling Saul not to give up, Vera goes to a strange pool and falls to her death. Meanwhile scientists Augie and Jin discuss the reason why experiments are failing. Starting a month ago, all the major accelerators across the world have been generating results that make no sense. Jin shares the results of Saul's experiment and Augie can see they have no rhyme or reason. At that moment she gets a call and when she picks up her phone, she sees some strange glowing lines that soon disappear. Then she turns around and sees the same lines floating around, but nobody can see them. Suddenly the lines transform and become the same countdown from the crime scenes. Sometime later, Augie continues to see the numbers around her on the train and even during Vera's funeral. Jin asks her if she saw a neurologist and Augie explains doctors didn't find anything wrong with her. Clarence is parked outside the funeral and takes pictures of everyone, including an old man called Mike who is in charge of an important oil company. Clarence follows Mike to a big field and takes pictures of the man leaving in a helicopter. Later in the evening, Augie is smoking on the street when she's approached by a woman named Tatiana who knows about the countdown and tells Augie that to make it stop she must shut down all her work. Then the following day at midnight she must look at the stars. Tatiana leaves after warning Augie not to let the countdown reach zero and gifting her a pack of cigarettes. Augie opens it and finds a little decoding gadget. The next day, Jin visits Vera's mother, who happens to be an older Wenji. She explains that Vera didn't act differently or act strange before dying, but she was playing a lot of video games. Wenji shows Jin a weird headset that looks nothing like a normal game and lets her have it. Later at her house, Jin puts on the headset and immediately appears inside a virtual reality while a voice announces it's level 1. She's wearing different clothes and there's a fortress in the distance, but as the sun quickly goes higher and the wind picks up, a skeleton is revealed in the sand. Jin screams and takes the headset off. In the evening, Augie brings Saul with her to look at the stars like Tatiana said. Augie also mentions that the gadget stopped being made in 1963. Then they look at the sky and when a clock announces it's midnight, Augie is shocked to notice all the stars lighting up only to then start blinking. Everyone around the world can see the same thing and Saul realizes that it's Morse code, so he uses the little gadget to decode it. The resulting message is a bunch of numbers that match Augie's countdown. The next day all news outlets are covering the strange phenomenon. Sok visits Wenji and says the incident didn't actually happen because satellites didn't pick up on it, so it must be a deepfake. Meanwhile Augie is making a demonstration at work but she's very nervous because her countdown only has a few minutes left. In the end she panics and orders her co-workers to shut it all down, then she rushes out of the building. To her surprise, the countdown suddenly disappears. She's then approached by Clarence, who offers his help. 
Back in 1968, the experiments at the base continue. They've been transmitting their message for several years now they've received nothing so far. Other countries haven't had any luck either. Wenji thinks that their signal is too weak and that they need to strengthen their signal, so she believes they should get their hands on the research made by American scientist Dr. Peterson. The soldiers are wary but bring her the information, which Wenji breaks down on a board. Peterson and his team received an intense radio burst from Jupiter on the same day they did, but China got it 13 minutes later from the sun. This means the sun reflected and amplified the radio waves from Jupiter, so they should direct their satellite at the sun to amplify their own message. The idea is presented to the commander, who immediately turns it down because shooting the sun with a radio beam would be bad political symbolism since their leader is seen as the red sun. However later when Wenji is at the control panel, she secretly moves the dish anyway and nobody notices. In the present, Clarence shows Augie footage from the street security cameras, revealing that Tatiana doesn't appear. However something is clearly happening because someone lighted Augie's cigarette. Clarence also explains that the countdown has appeared for many scientists around the world and the result is always the same, the numbers disappear if they stop working, and if they don't they die. Meanwhile Jin tries the headset again. Once she's in the game, she's approached by a count and his young follower. Then he starts heading to the fortress she saw last time while explaining part of the gameplay is predicting when a civilization is stable or chaotic. Suddenly the sun rises and the group rushes to hide behind a big rock. There isn't enough room for all three of them, so the follower walks out and the sun dehydrates her in seconds. The Count rolls up the remaining skin and explains they can fix her when a stable era comes. Then Jin calls fellow scientist Jack to get his opinion on the headset. He puts it on but as soon as he appears in the game, a woman tells him that he's not invited and kills him with her blade. Jack immediately takes the headset off and after telling Jin how realistic it was, he tries twice again only to always get the same result. This whole conversation is being heard by Clarence, who has bugged their phones. In the evening, Jack gets home and is shocked to find a box waiting in his living room. It turns out it's his own headset with a card inviting him to play. Jack immediately puts it on and instead of a fortress and Chinese clothes like Jin's game, he gets English clothes and a European castle. He's also approached by a follower and a count, who Jack immediately punches thinking he was going to get killed again. The count tells Jack his mission is to rehydrate the masses. The next day Jack shares his excitement about the game with his best friend and fellow scientist Will, who interrupts him with terrible news, he has stage 4 cancer and only a few months left. Back to Jin, she continues to play the game and makes it inside the fortress where the emperor awaits. The count is using sticks to make a prediction, so Jin points out it's not reliable and that they should use science instead. Her concerns are ignored and the count predicts 8 days of the chaotic era, followed by a stable era of 63 years. The count then makes Jin touch the ground, causing time to start going quickly outside until 8 days pass. Now the world has been renewed and there's a glorious sea around the fortress, so the soldiers throw all the rehydrated bodies into the water to make them live again. Jin throws the follower to and she quickly comes back. Unfortunately the prediction is soon proven wrong when the sky suddenly turns dark and a huge storm hits the area. Everyone panics and begins running toward the fortress, but Jin stays and struggles against the crowd to reach the follower. As soon as she touches her, the follower comes apart in frozen pieces. When the storm finally stops, the area is a frozen wasteland. Jin is then approached by Sofan, the woman who had been killing Jack. She explains that civilization number 137 was obliterated by extreme cold, but Jin established that science was superior to mysticism and therefore completed the level. Now she must use science to save the next civilization. Meanwhile Clarence visits his boss Thomas with an update on the investigation. In 1977, Ohio State University detected a 72-second signal that looked like an attempt at communication from someone in outer space. To this day nobody has been able to decode it and nobody outside Ohio detected it except for one observatory in China, where Mike lived in 1977. In the past, the soldiers take Wenji to see a younger Mike because she's the only one who can speak English. He says he's in China to save a bird that is close to extinction and he's been doing nothing but planting trees. The soldiers are looking to build a second lab in the area and Mike freaks out over what that would do to the environment, but he can't do anything because this isn't his property. Later in the evening, Wenji is keeping an eye on the signals when suddenly something starts coming through. A bunch of numbers appear on the screen followed by words in Chinese telling Wenji not to answer because if she does, then they will come to conquer Earth. After some thinking, Wenji sends back a message saying come, we cannot save ourselves, I will help you conquer our world. Back to the present, Clarence visits the European Council for Nuclear Research in Switzerland. He learns that half a dozen projects have been abandoned and over 30 scientists have died recently. One of the scientists died on his knees with his head in the bath like Oppenheimer's wife. Clarence gets to look around the man's apartment and finds a headset in the safe, which he takes with him. Meanwhile Augie's group is hanging out at Jack's house. Augie finds the headset and tries it on, only to be killed by Sofan. She immediately confronts Jack and Jin, who tell her it was just a game Vera played. Augie freaks out, pointing out humans don't have that technology and Vera died after playing it. 
Jack explains he has no idea where the headsets come from and that his security cameras didn't catch anyone breaking in. Saul agrees with Augie and says it's dangerous, so they make Jack and Jin promise they won't play anymore. However after everyone goes home, Jin and Jack share a video call to discuss how to pass the game while Clarence continues to spy on them. Jin has been playing a lot and has a whiteboard with all her losses to analyze the data. They decide to team up and connect at the same time, showing up at level 2. The follower is also there and she remembers every time she died. The duo enters a church and meets with the Pope, who wants an explanation for the sun's behavior. Jin says this planet has a three-body star system, meaning there are three suns and when the planet wanders among them instead of only circling one, then it triggers a chaotic era. The Pope calls her a heretic and sends her to burn, so Jack tries fighting a guard to save her. At that moment the sun burns the entire area down, including the church and the follower, until Jin and Jack are surrounded by nothing but lava. Their answer was right though, so Sofan appears to send them to level 3. Sometime later, Saul and Jack visit Will, who is recovering from his operation. Suddenly he starts saying lots of nonsensical things, like complimenting Jack's hat even though he isn't wearing one. Meanwhile Augie is pressured by her superiors to restart the project or they'll have to fire her. After lots of thinking, Augie starts the machine up again and the countdown immediately reappears, causing her to panic and turn the machine back off. The next day Jin and Jack meet to tackle level 3. This time they show up in Inner Mongolia, where an emperor built his pleasure dome. The area is filled with soldiers, including the follower. The duo enters the dome and finds the emperor with two scientists, who have set up the 30 million soldiers into a specific formation of ones and zeros. It's just like a human computer using binary. The soldiers hold a bunch of flags and turn them over and over until the scientists find a solution. They predict a chaos era will start in three days and last eight months, followed by a stable era of 10,000 years. The scientists touch the floor to make the days start passing fast while a mysterious man watches the game on various screens. Jack and Jin don't believe the calculations worked and when the other two scientists insult them, the modern language proves they're also players. The emperor tells his soldiers to boil Jack and Jin, so the duo is thrown inside a huge pot. As they deal with the boiling water, Jin touches the bottom to make the days pass until the three suns align. This eclipse causes everyone to suddenly float up into the air, but a soldier still manages to kill the scientists for their failure. Jin doesn't grab the follower in time and realizes their goal isn't saving the world, it's to save the people. This allows her and Jack to move to level 4. Afterward the watching man prints the results and takes them to his boss Mike, saying they have two new candidates. Mike vets Jack and Jin for the London summit, and after the employee leaves, Mika uses a radio to read a story to Sofan, who he calls my lord. Sometime later, Jin and Jack receive a card telling them to go to certain address at 10 pm to experience level 4. In the evening the duo heads there, unaware that Clarence is following them. Inside a strange building, they come across Tatiana, who tells them the answers are in level 4. Jin and Jack put on their headsets and show up on a wasteland, where the follower and Sofan are waiting for them. They explain that with a planet full of cataclysms and chaos, there's no hope of ever keeping a civilization going and no computer can solve the three-body problem. The only solution is to flee, which is why they've built a fleet of 1,000 spaceships that are making their way to Earth. After the explanation is over, Jin and Jack remove their headsets. Tatiana explains that aliens are real and they received an invitation to Earth from a human in China many years ago. Jack thinks it's all a scam, so he drops his headset and leaves. Jin stays and is invited to become part of an organization with the other champions from around the world. The card has coordinates to her next location. Outside, Clarence sees Jack leave and follows him to his home. Jack finds all the technology and lights in his house failing, and when he goes upstairs, he finds Tatiana there. As punishment for giving up, Tatiana pushes Jack against the glass and stabs him to death, then she disappears. In his car, Clarence can see the glass cracking but not Tatiana. In 1982, Wenji is finally free and works as a professor. She travels to London for a conference and meets with Mike, who is now in charge of his father's oil company. After confirming they still hold the same views about the rotten world, Wenji admits that she did something while working in the base. Back in the present, Clarence takes Augie and Jin to Thomas' office to watch the security footage. It's clear something invisible is attacking Jack, and Augie thinks it must be Tatiana. Thomas tells Jin to accept the invitation because it'll take them to the killer. Sometime later, Clarence informs Thomas that Mike is on an oil tanker that hasn't delivered any oil in 40 years. It's then shown that the tanker is Mike's base of operations, which is filled with young people who are taught the alien overlord as their savior. Mike gets a call from Sofan telling him that his enemies know where he is and compliments his smile, implying the aliens can actually see him. He starts reading Little Red Riding Hood, and Sofan gets very confused by the wolf's antics. Mike has to explain what lying and tricks are, realizing the aliens don't have those concepts and believed all the stories were real. When Sofan finally understands Mike has been lying, she says they can't trust him and that they're afraid of him, so she hangs up and never contacts him again. In the evening, Jin drives to the meeting while Thomas tracks her movements and Clarence follows her. At the right coordinates, 
a guard confirms Jin's identity and makes her get in another car, which takes her to an abandoned building where all the champions have gathered. At that moment Wenji shows up and it's revealed she was the founder of the organization. She explains the aliens will arrive in 400 years, so they must prepare the world for their arrival. Her speech is suddenly interrupted when Thomas armed men storm into the building and surround the crowd. Wenji tells everyone to sit down and cooperate because she's sure their lord will protect them. The soldiers begin tying everyone up and try to take Jin out, but Tatiana notices and opens fire, causing everyone to panic and start running. While Wenji continues to sit on the stage, Thomas soldiers have a gunfight with the organization's guards and people start dying all over the place. Tatiana tries to shoot Jin, but Clarence shows up and shoots Tatiana in the leg to make her fall. Then Clarence drags Jin outside. Moments later ambulances arrive and start taking care of the wounded people while the soldiers arrest the others. Nearby Tatiana manages to escape by crawling away on the grass. In 1984, Mike takes Wenji to his tanker so they can establish their own research base there. Mike explains the aliens already tried to contact her again but she left the base before she could see it. He's gathered all the messages in his computer and says Wenji has brought hope back for humanity, then they kiss. In the present, Clarence interrogates Wenji, who explains she invited the aliens because humanity needs to be saved. She also confirms Mike is Vera's father, but he never met her and she hadn't known his identity because Wenji had tried to protect her from this whole deal. Vera never used the headset, it was a lie Wenji told Jin to recruit her. Mike's tanker is called Judgment Day and it's capable of communication faster than light speed, which they built thanks to the aliens' advanced knowledge. Clarence and Thomas conclude they need to get the data on the ship, but they can't just send soldiers with weapons because it would give them time to destroy all the data and missiles could damage it. Remembering Augie's nanofiber tech experiment, Clarence goes to see her and asks her to finish her work. At first she refuses because she's scared of dying, but Clarence convinces her it would be revenge for Jack. In the evening they go to Augie's lab and she turns on the machine, only to notice the countdown doesn't reappear. She hugs Clarence in relief and he says the aliens don't seem to be protecting their followers anymore. The next day they take the nanotech to a group of naval officers who have been hired by Thomas to go after Judgment Day. This mission will kill a bunch of people and Augie protests, but her indignation is ignored. Later in Panama, Augie guides the team to get the nanotech ready, although she continues to protest against the death of civilians. When the tanker finally appears on the river, the nanotech immediately attacks, and it's so tiny that nobody can see it. Every single person aboard gets killed including the kids, resulting in an absolute bloodbath. The nanotech also attacks the structures, slowly bringing down the ship. Mike runs away as he tries to escape, but he falls and breaks his ankle. On his knees, he apologizes to his lord before he is killed as well. The ship eventually comes apart and crashes on the shore, catching on fire. After helicopters put out the flames, the team searches the wreckage and finds Thomas' body with a red box in his hands. For the next two weeks various scientists try to analyze it, however it's too advanced for them to crack it. Suddenly they get access to the information without doing anything, which means the aliens want them to know what's inside. There are 28 gigabytes of text and media files, plus an unknown file type that's a 100 million gigabytes. Meanwhile Thomas visits Wenji and shows her the recording of Mike's last conversation with the aliens. Hearing this shocks Wenji, who is starting to consider the aliens may be turning hostile after all. Afterward Thomas brings Jin to his headquarters and shows her the mysterious file. Suspecting it may be another game level, Jin and Thomas put on the headsets and appear in a post-apocalyptic wasteland where Sofan is waiting for them. Sofan explains the aliens don't look human and her form is for the player's benefit. She also says that humanity advances too fast, so in 400 years their technology will be better than the aliens and could possibly kill the incoming fleet. Their goal has always been to kill humanity's advancements, which is why they targeted scientists. To do so they use softens, which are protons turned into a sentient computer. That's the mysterious file in the box. There are more dimensions than the eye can see and they've managed to use these higher dimensions to mess with the very foundations and fabric of how humans see the world. They can make a mind as large as the world and then shrink it right down. There are four softens in total, and each pair is entangled on a quantum level. There are two on Earth and two that remain with the aliens. Since they have no mass, they were sent to Earth at a speed faster than light and landed months ago at the best scientific places in the world. They wrapped the planet in illusions, distorting what people see with countdowns and doomsday prophecies. Terrified by the vision Sofan is playing, Jin and Thomas remove their headsets, only to find all the computers blinking. Screens all over the world are taken over as well and soon a message appears in all the languages saying you are bugs. Then a strange veil covers the sky with a great eye looking down on everyone and reflecting everything at the same time. Soon the entire world's population starts panic and riots take over the streets to the point the army is sent out to try to calm people down. Information is sent out about still having 400 years to get ready, but it doesn't help. The UN promises they'll have a plan yet nobody believes them. Mandatory curfews are in place and some religious sects begin worshipping the new alien overlords. Other people have started to self-delete and their bodies are lined up near the Thames. At Thomas Manor, he's gathering soldiers and scientists to try to think of a plan. 
He wants to send up a probe to intercept the enemy fleet to learn more about them, but it'd take 398 years to reach them. Then Thomas meets with Jin and asks her to find a way to make the probe move faster. After lots of thinking, Jin proposes they should use nuclear weapons to pull off something called nuclear pulse propulsion. This means their ship would use a radiation sail to be propelled after a series of atomic bombs out in space. The scientist team immediately shuts the idea down because it's very expensive and the margin for error is incredibly small. They believe they have 400 years and time is on their side, but Thomas disagrees and approves Jin's plan. To get the money, an organization called the Stars Our Destination starts selling stars to rich people. Later Jin visits Augie and asks her to join the project. However Augie gets furious when she hears she'd be working with Thomas, who she thinks is a murderer. She turns down the offer, saying this project will just result in another Hiroshima. In the morning, Jin and Will chat on the beach and release two paper boats on the sea. Later Will tells Augie that what Jin needs is her, pointing out that Augie has tons of knowledge and talent. He knows Jin wouldn't get involved in anything if it wasn't for the greater good. This changes Augie's mind, so she goes to see Jin to accept her offer. At the same time, Will sees the boats come back and thinks it's a sign, so he decides to use all the money Jack left him to buy a star. Afterward Will shares the news with Saul, only to suddenly pass out. He's immediately taken to a hospital while the star plaque is sent to Jin because Will put it under her name. Meanwhile Clarence visits Wenji and demands to know why Vera jumped. It turns out Vera intercepted the messages between Wenji and Mike and ended things because she was ashamed of her family. Eventually Wenji is released and an agent follows her, only to see she goes back to her home. In the lab, the team finally manages to put a chimpanzee in frozen sleep without killing it. When they wake it up, they make the chimpanzee do some tests to confirm its brain is still working well. The animal is as smart and alert as it was before sleeping, although it pukes after eating a banana. This is seen as a normal side effect and the experiment is considered a success, so now they need to test it on humans. The team later informs Thomas that the probe would only be able to carry a very small person to leave room for the explosives. They conclude they could send only the brain, so it must come from someone who knows about science but also will die soon. Thomas realizes Will fits perfectly, which makes Augie and Jin freak out. Since Thomas ignores their protests and rushes to make a call, Augie decides to quit. When Augie returns to her old job, she discovers she's been kicked out from the nano project and her sponsor is keeping her research. Furious, Augie leaks everything on dozens of open source platforms like WikiLeaks, making the technology available to everyone. In the meantime, Jin visits Will to explain the project to him. Will says he won't do anything if Jin doesn't want him to, which makes her cry. Later Thomas shows up and offers him to sign the contract, which affirms Jin's loyalty to the human race. At that moment Will decides not to sign because his loyalty isn't to humanity, it's to Jin. Thomas promises to come back with a modified contract. Sometime later, Saul visits Will to try to convince him not to do it. Will ignores it and takes a tablet from a nurse, which he uses to consent that he wants to self-delete. By the time Jin shows up, Will is already dead and the doctors are removing his brain. In a caravan in a forest, Tatiana is having breakfast when she's suddenly contacted by Sofan, who tells her she's part of them and something much larger than herself. At the airport, Wenji realizes she's being followed and switches seats to be next to the agent. Eventually they reach Inner Mongolia and the agent agrees to drive Wenji to the old base, which is in ruins. As she thinks about the past, Wenji considers ending things for herself, but Tatiana arrives to stop her. She explains falling would be incredibly painful, but she can offer something gentle and painless. The women sit to watch the sunset and Tatiana tells Wenji she deserves to rest as Wenji dies. Meanwhile Saul has come to terms with the fact humanity is doomed, so he spends his time smoking and enjoying one-night stands. One day while taking a walk with his latest date, Saul is knocked off by someone skating past, which causes a bunch of cars to stop or crash until the Uber Saul called for hits his date. Afterward Saul is interrogated by Clarence, who knows Saul talked to Wenji before she left the country and was murdered. Saul's date was killed by a self-driving car, so Clarence believes Saul is being targeted by the aliens and he was accidentally saved by the skater. Next Saul is given bulletproof clothes and taken to the United Nations in New York, where the Planetary Defense Council is holding a meeting to discuss the Wallfacer project. The aliens have access to all their technology but can't read humans' minds, so they've chosen three people called wallfacers, who will have to make a plan to defeat the aliens. They mustn't tell anyone about it to keep it safe, and they'll be able to exploit every resource needed without having to explain their actions. The chosen people are a general with an impressive military history, a professor with experience in asymmetrical battles, and Saul because of his studies under the greatest scientific minds. Saul is in shock but behaves during the ceremony. However when it's done, he asks why he was actually chosen and the leader reveals it's because the aliens must be watching him for a reason. Furious, Saul rejects the offer and leaves the building, only to suddenly get shot. Clarence immediately takes him to the hospital, and when Saul wakes up, he learns he only has a broken rib. Saul appears on the news and learns his shooter was caught, so he asks Clarence to bring him over. When the cops bring the sniper, Saul asks him why the aliens care so much about him. The guy doesn't know, 
He's just a religious fanatic that wants to do the Lord's work. In the forest, Tatiana comes back from the grocery store and finds the caravan's door open. She goes inside with her gun out, only to discover a headset was left for her. After reading a note that says if one of us survives, we all survive, she puts the headset on. Sometime later, Saul joins Jin to watch the probe launch. The frozen brain is successfully loaded in the probe, which quickly takes off. The probe flies through space and the nuclear explosives go off without issues, but after a strong beginning, the trajectory deviates from its initial path and the probe jets off in the wrong direction. Everyone in ground control is speechless at their failure. Later Thomas is in his private plane arranging things for the wallfacers when suddenly the electronics start glitching out. Sofan appears on the screen and makes the plane shake before appearing in front of Thomas. She announces that he's a strong leader, so the aliens will be watching him and influencing everything he does until the day he dies. Thomas has a vision of the countdown and his death before Sofan disappears.